Got that. If not, you'll start mm -hmm. getting texts. Now to do the Put in well. Would it be the well building class one? Yes. Maybe. Thank you. So much. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. It was in Google Drive. We're there. That's the one. Yep. You're awesome. Are you having fun today? I was like, oh my goodness, what we should have done is just to vote for I thought the market had slowed down. I was like, you know, we're going to have the market Okay. All right. You are good. We've got one person on here so far. All right. You're sharing screen. It's recording. It's up it here. is 101. And I was all in the back. Well, they were the yeah, I this is a long term wealth building class. So this is off of my story. It's super wealthy, but um, it is my story incorporated into what I've learned at Keller Williams and honestly, most of it's at Keller Williams as far as what I've learned. Previous to that, I was with mom and pops and they did not teach wealth building. They didn't teach you how to grow wealth, how to be wealthier, and they taught you, well, they didn't really teach wealth building. I actually know that, but that's the reality of what I had with mom and pops. But I figured it out, you know, but it's not horrible. I'm not saying bad, it's all part of your path. But I sure wish somebody could have sat me down a little sooner and could have helped me a little sooner. So, you know, I actually love doing this class because I love getting folks to think about things. And when they say, you know, who the five people you're around, like that's huge. You know, Nicole Belcher, when she was doing hair, yeah. was not the Nicole Belcher that's around the people. Part of the reason she stepped into this position is because she got to be around high-minded people and just just what they say and those things you hear and the programs they're using and all that. It just it, it pours into you. So you're gonna know Tina Fryer a little bit better by the end of <laughs> by the end of this class. And I have to. Hey, Matt. Hello. Hi. How you doing? Come forward, Tina. Let's move forward. Okay. Okay. Um, still behind us. Good. Now you can still hear. And there we go. There's the little arrow I'm looking for. Um. All right. Tina Fryer, secret sauce. My story. Game of true or false. Tina and Oprah both pack their lunch. True or false? True. True or false? Oh, I'm gonna say true probably true it is true um <laughs> oprah packs her lunch she's like I, she's a good cook and she's like yeah i like my food i bring my lunch it saves money saves time going out all the time uh-huh um uh, tina Fryer goes to starbucks every day false <laughs> i don't know i've seen you at starbucks a lot yeah you actually have <laughs> but i don't go to starbucks seven dollars for a cup of coffee not my jam you know now do I say you can't have your small pleasures? Absolutely. And you decide how you spend that money. But for me, yeah, that's that's not a daily indulgence. Um, true or false? Tina Fryer's never had a car load. False. That's what I was going to say, too. False. All right. You would be right about that. <laughs> so I, I, I'm a debt-free person, and I... Do not believe in debt. Um, I did have a mortgage at one time. I do not have a mortgage now, but I did. 
Um, and I've always bought my cars cash. My actually red button looked better than that, way better. I'm gonna have to tell her to upgrade the picture. But that was my college car at Virginia Tech. I bought it for my brothers. Um, and uh, when I had my first child, this was, I got called grandma because I drove a $3,000 Impala because the Impala had been built for 10 years and it was just rock solid. Like you would not spend any money on maintenance. That's what I always looked for. Like I didn't want to get nickel and dime. So it's a maintenance free car. You have to have no pride. I actually had pride in my red bug. I loved my red bug. I had no pride in grandma and grandma's car. <laughs> I kept my children safe and it was super cheap. So, and it, didn't suck a bunch yeah, of um, Moved to the van when I had three children and then bought three Dodge minivans. Um, but I did buy those new. And when you have lived this life and then you get that first new and it's reliable and it's clean and, you know, it, there's joy in that. And um, yeah, so I, I, uh, and now I have my first somewhat luxury car with a Volvo and um, it's not true true luxury but it's funny because my 11 year old grandson said that's not a luxury car and I said well they sold it at Berglund and it says luxury <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's safe and economical um, so one of the big things about uh, wealth is to write down your goals. And we talk about that in business planning clinic, not just your your goals for your company, but your goals for your life. What, how many, you know, how many investment properties do you want? You know, what return do you want on your investment properties? What do you want for vacation time? How many weeks of vacation? Where do you want to go on vacation? Hi, I'm Tina Fryer. Hi, I'm Monica Nicely. Ooh, Monica, thanks for joining us. Yeah, do you know everybody in the room? Probably not. No, let's take a minute. <laughs> yeah, because Monica's here. So Keith is my counterpart, and I told him just to jump in if he would like to, keep, you know. You should come to the class side, Monica. What's your last name? Uh, mm -hmm. oh, she, she was at the, uh, the one board. did RBAR. Yeah, on the board. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 Got them. Yep. I, make, I, make, I make quite an impression. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice to see you. Emily here in the back is interviewing for our dozy position. Uh, so yeah. I thought she was talking about wealth, and I was like, join the class. This is what we do. Director of First Impression. Yeah. So Ryan is. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, I'll let you all do your introduction. So. Monica and I came from MKB together, so oh, yeah, okay. friends here. Okay. <laughs> I'm Jeff, and I work with Ryan, Norm, April, Hillary. Yep, I'm April. So we're all on the same team. Yeah, they're all on Norm pulling. Uh, what is it called? It's it's with the Norm cells yeah. round up and beyond. All right. Oh, I never knew. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, that's true. A Harvard Business Study found that the 3% of the graduates from their MBA program who had their goals written down ended up earning 10 times as much as the other 97 who uh, put together just 10 years after graduation. So it'd be great if you looked at them too, you know, if you wrote them down and looked at them. Um, but yeah. That's a crazy stat. So I had a, uh, actually it's my team leader in Roanoke and he said he makes it a date. Um, every January 1st, he takes his wife, just the two of them, and they, they do their goal setting for the year as a family. And it's not just money and wealth and that, but it's also like what trips, what more do we want to do with the kids? You know, it's this whole thing. And I thought, and they kind of make it a date night and I was like, or a date day. So um, goals are always supposed to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. So specific, what do you want to do? Measurable, how will you know when you've reached it? Achievable, is it in your power to accomplish it? Realistic, can you realistically achieve it? And timely, when exactly do you want to accomplish the goals? So um, 
my admin, her name, um, she's been with me eight years. Rachel Lanier had never written down her goals. And so we wrote them down. And at the time, she lived with her parents in the basement with her five or six year old son. And her goal was to have a house, to have chickens. And, you know, so we wrote those out and I think they were five-year goals and we accomplished them in three. So then, you know, we had to sit down and do the process over again, which I love. And I love that we accomplished them in three instead of five. So it's, it's really fun to do it with your teams if you have team folks um, and not just for yourself or for your family. How a plan to grow, how to make a plan to grow your wealth. Um, if you have debt, uh, so work on a debt reduction snowball method. So this is, um, he teaches perfect peace. He's the Christian gentleman. Dave Ramsey, thank you. Um, so you pay the small bill off first and then you add what you were paying on the small bill to your next smallest debt. And you keep working on that until everything is paid off. Um, then you work on investment savings and then an investment plan. Um, tighten your belt, save, save, save. Nothing else matters if you can't learn to live within your means. It's not what you earn, it's what you keep and invest. So you kind of identify with um, what you really need. Do you really need Starbucks in the morning? No. That's not a need. That's a want. And I'm not judging anybody. Like if we have our faithful 7 a.m. going through Starbucks. Yeah. What do you want and expenses you should cut? I honestly, during COVID was a great example too. When, when I actually was paying attention and was like, oh my gosh, I was paying two audibles. I now have 30 credits on audible because I've been paying for a year and a half, two audible fields and never realized one was connected to higher Dean Fryer and ones that T Fryer, TRG. So um, yeah. Knowing your income uh, rates, and we're going to talk about tax strategies here towards the end, but knowing your income rates and when you do do some savings to a SEP IRA or an IRA, um, and if you are in these different, that's that's real money that you are now hiding or, or pushing off so that you are not paying taxes at 22% or, or you're deferring them to your retirement. So just even understanding how much you are giving, these are income tax rates for a single is important. Protect yourself from the unexpected. You know, we just had a big shift in the market. Our October, November, December were down for the whole region and the whole nation. Our whole nation shifted 35% uh, less sales, and this area was only 15%. So don't, we follow the nation, but we follow them a lot gentler in the, just the number of sales. Um, but having the state you're like, oh, all I got is debt right now. You're dollars in the savings while you get your debt paid down. is a great, you know, first step in the plan. But then the second step is a one, three, six months of savings. So one thing Keller Williams forced up, franchise. we had a franchise fee, and then I had to put three months reserve in the account. So Keller Williams here and in Lynchburg has three months reserve. Honestly, I didn't have that. I didn't have that for my family, nor did I really have it for my other business, real estate business. Now I have it for all my businesses. And when I go into these shifts, I'm not like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't, I can't make next month's rent because I do have some cash that's easily accessible. Um, so your goal this year might be to have one month. Your goal next year might be three months. And then, you know, with three years from now, it might be to have six months um, in expenses. And then a lot of realtors don't have health insurance. So the thing about health insurance, when you have debt, 
um, to healthcare providers, that is not affected by bankruptcy. If you go bankrupt, you still are going to owe those. Um, they will put you on these payments where you're paying $50 forever, um, but you will owe that money. You need homes that have these long, big debts for medical work. So getting health insurance, even if it's the Obama plan or, you know, just high deductibles, whatever you have to do to get health insurance, that would be a great goal because long-term wealth, when you have something happen or it just happens to the children, and when you are self-employed, it's an easy thing, especially if you're young and self-employed, it's easy to cut that out. So, yeah. You know... Also, just protecting your identity. I'm super careful about, you know, sending, you know, my my IDs, my security number. I don't. I, I'm if a doctor asks for it, I'm like, why do you? I don't security number. So protecting your identity um, is huge, and using paper shredders, being careful. We should do this for our clients. Um, I use credit cards and PayPal, uh, not a debit card. So I, I've I've had another investor had her identity stolen and oh my gosh you know and I really think she was very careless with how she would send tax returns through emails and she just did too much by email um and then if you want you can do the do not call register <laughs> we call people that uh all the time so we don't really love that people are on the do not call registry but that can also be a way to help you protect your identity. Um, real estate, um, when we start talking about uh, investing, real estate agents have an unfair advantage when it comes to spotting great investment properties. And we should, use, and we should tell people that we're interested. And whether you personally want it or whether you know someone in the office that buys foreclosures and maybe you you know, you just get 5,000 on that deal because you pass it on. Like, but if we don't tell people that we do buy foreclosures or we do do flips or our team does flips or my husband needs small lots right now. He wants a bunch of small lots. So, but I'm not putting that message out. And he's like, Tina, help me. You've got 118 agents. Like, does anyone have a developable property that I can get two or four an infill lot that's coming? We have... Uh, my team member. So making people aware that you're looking for investment properties. I love hanging out with Matt because he's always telling me a story about a client and he's bought one of his clients' houses um, that that client wanted to buy another house, but they had to sell this house first. It was last year or two. So the house was going to go quickly. And he was like, I'll buy your house. And, and, and and they were like, well, that's great. And he said, I'm not going to buy it for your list price. I'm going to buy it for a discount. I think the discount was like 20%. It was pretty high. It was definitely more than the commission. Um, but they just didn't have time. They didn't very good. It's part of his investment portfolio now. And I think that's brilliant. Um, but letting people know that we're either representing the investors yes, yes. that want to flip, invested foreclosure is going to be on the rise. So I have a new team member, Phil Smith, and she said she was going to go look at a $65,000 house. It's kind of in an area that's turning over. The son is the only person he inherited it. Um, he may not be able to sell it for a while until it goes through whatever goes through probate or whatever. They only owe 15000 on it. But he like needs money right now, like today. He can't make his rent like today. So I was like, Cheryl, you know, if you want to either figure it out for yourself or bring it to me, I don't know how that would work, but it's going to have to work at a discount. You know, it's going to have to be fair. My thing is just that all of us in our travels and in our posts and whatever, if we have these things that we want brought to us, we have to let people know that we're in the market for it and that um, and tell the agents that we're around that we do foreclosures. We buy single wides. Do you buy single wides? You know, what, you know, what, what might you be getting to that? Um, yeah, that we, yeah, that we might be interested in. Um, 
Yeah. You mentioned that you think foreclosures are going to come on the rise. What what indicators are you hearing, or where are you, where are you hearing it from that say foreclosures are going to increase? Because that's something I've been debating, but I'm curious to hear like where where that's coming from. So you are going to family reunion. I am. And I love Gary Keller does like this whole two hours of what the market is and where it's going and foreclosures are on the rise. Um, Keith, do you, I feel like we've heard it um, through Joe Martin and some of the stats that he does. Um, Cause I would, at first I thought there would, but then I started doing more research and I, I'm anticipating that we're gonna see less foreclosures because everyone got so much instant equity in their house. Like why would you get foreclosed and just sell it? Right? Yeah. But I've heard from time to time that foreclosures are coming. I just can't figure out why people are Yeah. I mean, so my opinion on this is they are going to go up a little, but only a little. Because there's there's people that have bought even in the last year and got into a bad situation and don't even have the market is largely plateaued mm -hmm. and so they don't even have the ten twelve thousand dollars to get out of their house like they pay realtor fees and some, you know things like that right and so though there's people that whereas a year ago even them even them, even they would have been able to sell their house because over that prior year it went up 20 percent. you know what i mean so are they thinking it's just folks that have bought in the last year because if you bought I mean, two years ago three years ago four unless years ago, they refi so much equity yeah unless they, they refi unless, unless they refi good so so that yeah, to my point what you just said i don't think it's going to go up a lot i think it'll go it'll tick up a little bit but very different from the, the last shift in 2008 9 and 10 where the market plummeted down right values and tons of people underwater. Yeah. Very different in my opinion on that. Um though and you guys tell me since I don't live here, but the inventory is still at a premium, meaning it's still yeah. low. Right? Oh, yes. So so most sellers can sell their house unless there's something very odd they wrong about. Fair. This is according to the year in 2022. What are you the hundreds that you keep comparing? The okay. US foreclosure market reports uh filings are up 115 percent from 2021 but down 34 percent to 2019. that is and exactly what i would have to and that's what i you know i try to read through the media people yeah. say well it it's doubled since last year yeah. well yeah but last These year all, it was none not yeah. yeah like it is doubled yeah. from yeah. once yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. like that's like a person like yeah. like just like, like, like inflation and, like inflation is down a percent or whatever but we're still, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's still a sense of what? Like, right. I mean, it, let me just note you to your point. Numbers like, like people keep like saying, Well, I'm like, well, I haven't bought an investor right now. Like, well, I'm gonna wait for the foreclosure. I'm like, dude, I don't think it happened. Mm. Like, I really just don't think I agree. If, like, yeah. if this year, <laughs> hypothetically, and I can use not real numbers, but if if last year in 2022, uh, foreclosures represented one percent of sales, and this year they represent three percent of sales. That's a three hundred percent increase. Right. It's still not very. No, it's not a very big portion of the market. I mean, it's still a very small. Market. Well, that'll be interesting. I guess yeah. there. So, at family reunion, there is going to be a little bit of on that. Oh, yeah. state of the market. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's that's yeah. the one where you said it's everything. Yeah, that's really good. I was curious, Dina. Be sober and think of it. Yeah, and <laughs> if I see it, I'll it. think of you and I'll right. I'll send yeah. it on. Be curious. I'm I'm trying to figure that out myself. I just I hear people say saying it, but I can't figure out why. Yeah, people you are want saying. to know the facts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I want to know the facts too, and I think it's very interesting too when you say, yeah, if you go from one to two, it's a hundred percent increase, but you're just yeah. like, yeah, right. if yeah, there were only two, and now there's four. Okay, who cares? Right. You know? right. So great. Um, learn the rules of money. Um, there's so many great podcasts out there. Uh, yeah, there's a million. Um, but I actually am a big, I really like um, financial peace and um, Dave Ramsey, but he actually is kind of anti-mortgage. So, you know, you've got to take it all with a grain of salt and, you know, use it, you know, but I, he does teach, you know, that snowball rule. He does teach the three months reserve. And a lot of that is really good. And one th interesting thing he says is when you buy your second home, you buy a catch. I'm like, oh, because I want to kind of think about buying a second condo up the, the lake. And I'm like, oh, I I you have to that? buy cash. I'm like, I don't know that. But that's it. That's that? it. Yeah. yeah, just I mean, in general. So, I mean, I I don't dislike Dave Ramsey at all. It's, it's not a one size fits all thing. I mean, it depends. It, I mean, it depends on a lot of factors. If you're if you're very prone to running up hundreds of thousands of dollars of credit card debt and stuff, yeah, you should pay really close attention and get out of that and get back to a cash situation. If you're pretty responsible and you have, you know, healthy reserves and stuff, 
it depends a lot on what the rates are. I mean, like if mm -hmm. like I was, I almost, I, I'm, I'm bummed. I just didn't get around to doing it, but I almost took a hundred thousand dollars out of my house like a couple of years ago, just because it was only at like two and a half percent and I could do anything with it and double that. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I just never got around to doing it. Now well, they're people, having six people <laughs> so, focus on the interest rate. So, and that would be very anti what he would suggest. Yeah. Like, like we're just like, so people focus on the interest rate, but it's interest rate in relation to inflation, where yeah. when it's two and inflation's four, it's negative money. So yeah, I would, absolutely. Why would you ever buy cash? You're no. always leverage. So yeah. You always have to pay attention, I think, yeah. to those two yeah. on what's the true interest rate, right? So well, it's never be 6% interest. If inflation's nine, it's still negative 3% yeah. interest. Yeah. 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 So, it's advice that's good, but it's just, I would say, and. Yeah. Mm. But I think it depends on where you're coming from, too. Like, he came from a flat road. Yeah. But I'm reading the shift by. Right. Very... <laughs> I mean, I've done that. And yeah. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. Like, just if you follow it, how quickly you can come back. You yeah. know, I was never like about homeless or yeah. whatever, like he was. But yeah. I built a house and a whole, whole lot more money yeah. than I ever thought I would. Like Gary Keller said, he paid his house off too. Yeah. So that it, when he wanted to go into a venture, it, he yeah. wasn't yeah. risking his house. Yeah. There's the principles are really good. And there's a lot of things that aren't just the money. Like there's peace of mind of having a house paid off, you know, yeah. there's other things that right. to consider other than just if it stresses you out to have a mortgage, don't go buy another investment property with a mortgage. Right. I mean, like, so it depends on your appetite for risk. Yeah, absolutely. And it also depends on your age. My appetite for risk is not as high as yeah. what it was when I was 30, you know. So yeah. you know, it should it should shift as you shift. Um there's hold and the second one is the red there's another one on investing one's not hold one's flip. yeah flip, flip, flip and one. then the flip and the hold or the two yeah um those are gary keller books they're great books they're audible too so you can listen to them on audible um and awesome book uh i actually have read the millionaire next door i thought that was a very interesting book but there's so many resources out there and these are some of them that um would be great to learn about you know how to start investing um so it's always great you know people talk about their investing and you know all the great things they've done and the smart things they've done but i actually want to share with you two of my stupidest things mm -hmm. so um my first stupidest thing that i've done is uh when it comes to investing is um we had a paid off piece of land behind my house, 20 acres. I lived on this half acre house, raised my family in it, had an $800 house payment. It's like, dang, I got that land paid for. This house is way paid down. You know, let's go build on that land. So we built this monster house, which we were all going to live in a couple of years. It was going to be my retirement. But I had a jumbo loan and a jumbo loans, as we all know, are a higher interest rate. So I went from an $800 house payment to a $4,000 house Ooh. payment. The highest I've had is two, but that brief period. So of course, 2006 to 2008 happened. And I'm self-employed, I'm selling real estate, my husband's a builder, and I'm trying to make that $4,000 house payment. What ended up happening is I sold that house and lost all the equity of that land that I had paid off. And that land paying that off was, I had bought four parcels, sold these three, so this one could be free and clear. And I felt pretty smart in forest with mountain views, only to have lost it, you know. So the reality is, I don't think I should have been in a four thousand dollar house payment ever. Period. Job. Not my smartest move, but I, I survived it, and I only it. lost the equity of that one property. Well, I bought a house in end of 05. I mean, you couldn't do this worse than what my wife. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think I did it pretty so good. So <laughs> uh, end of 05. It's like two weeks before I got my real estate license. I didn't even get paid on the house. It's like I wasn't even licensed yet. And um, so I, I don't know how many people were in the business in 05, other than two of us. But um, but uh, so that was when it was really terrible mortgage products that then led to the crash. You were in that class because of that talk. You, you guys were too. So anyway. Um, so the it was new construction to be completed in like April of 06. And it was a no doc loan. I didn't even have a job because I was getting my real estate license. I had eight inches when I was two before. So I had no, so I had no financial, like no um, you know, pay stuff, or I had no income to 
Yeah, that's right. So anyway, so because of that, the rate was 8.25 because you pay a really high rate for that, right? Anyway, so our, our mortgage payment is $3,800. And that play field. Wow. And then, oh, it gets better. Oh. So then um, in 09, I'm advising all my clients that, hey, I don't think we've gotten to the bottom yet. I told my wife, I'm like, I don't think this is where we want to live for the next 20 years. And, and by the way, when you buy new construction right before the market declines, you're in new construction like forever mm -hmm. because all those those houses stop selling. You know? mm -hmm. We're like sitting there on the roads that aren't paved yet. Blah, blah. So anyway, so we sold the house and brought a check for 114000 to get out of it. So real fun. But you did so, declare uh, bankruptcy. You did not declare bankruptcy. Same year. So anyway, I can sympathize with the pain and suffering. Yeah. Here, so. yeah. And we both thank you for allowing us to learn from your mistakes. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Anybody wants to buy me a beer because I'm working now. Sure. That's a big <laughs> check. And don't think that your clients don't have those checks to bring sometimes. Like, I don't think we're going to get I that. I had a different back. client that ironically brought almost the exact same money, like 113 mm -hmm. to, to get yeah. Right. So lots so. of them brought 80, 70, 60. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I also, you know, I've been Keller Williams now for 10 years, really, again, with mom and pops, didn't really think about investing. My husband said he never wanted to be a landlord because he thought he had to answer the phone if they called. So I just never participated in that and didn't. And now being Keller Williams, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, like we should have done this so long ago. So my husband built a building of seven townhouses, premier subdivision making 1600 a month off each do you have a mortgage on that a big mortgage on the seven town home um and that's been a good money maker 20 percent return for us it's been a great great investment uh, so now i own seven doors i had zero until two years ago and then i did four more doors in the town of vinton to do my keller williams vinton which has not worked out and now because it's commercial property it is sitting vacant and it's that vacant now for three or four months anyone that wants to sell it or bring me my leasey i would i will pay you i would be happy to pay you but for tina fryer i learned two things one is i don't want to be an hour away from my investments two i don't think i want commercial property not to say that lots of people haven't made huge money with commercial but commercial is either making you great money and a good return and is rolling or if it sits, it tends to sit for months up to years. You all have driven by the commercial property that's been open for years. That doesn't tend to happen with a house. So from my perspective, I always want to make sure I have return. And I also always want to make sure I have enough in that three months, six months, you know, category that if so I have a young buck in uh, Lynchburg and he's going to buy 22 more investment properties. And I'm like, that's awesome, Skylar. Like he is going big and going strong. I'm like, but he had seven properties with no renter in them last September. I'm like, you need to have the cash reserve so that, you know, as you get these, this ball rolling, I'm not trying to discourage him, but I'm also like, you need enough cash reserve that if seven come open in the same time or something happens, that you can get through that. Um, yeah, and you're around a lot of smart people, like Mac, Nicole. Like Especially there's, Norm. there's Norm. Norm, how do you have investment property? We do. Yeah. You do. How many do you have? We have five, six. Yeah, there's six. And how many? When did you start? When did we start? We turned our first home into a rental. We our second home. Oh, I love that scenario. Um, which is the best act, real estate advice we were ever given was to never sell your first oh, home no. because you usually buy it at a price that you can afford yeah, probably for the rest there. of your life. Um, real quick pause. Does anybody else know the other real primary reason why that's a good thing? It's very likely that you have a principal interest rate that will be lower than if you went and sold that and bought a different investment property. You have to pay a couple points higher. Yeah. We've got a contract out on one right now. We won't hear from tomorrow. So. And what is your goal? Um, you, you have written goals. 20. <laughs> we Whoa. want 10 doors. 20. The person here, right? Cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we need to write um, down. So we, we always said we always said we always said 10 by 40, but um 10 by 40. We'll see. Yeah, I mean okay. we, how old are we, you? We're 40. Man, dude, you, you just 
Look forward. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is not nice anymore. You guys are saying me. Um, we always said 10 by 40, so we'll be there, but I think the debate is where we go from there. Um, we focus particularly in case spring nicer areas. So mm. our our thing is not necessarily monthly cash flow, it's the asset that we're gonna have when we go to retire. The the like like we could rent some of ours for twenty two, twenty three hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. We try to focus on nicer homes, easier tenants to, right. you know, a little less maintenance. And that's what I did. Too. We've we've never we've never missed a single. Everyone's always paid us. Yeah, so that's it. Oh, really, that great. It's just a really great discussion right there. Uh -huh. Um, with anything, I mean, like in life, investments, jobs, even like we're all we're constantly making some trade of risk, money, and time. Mm -hmm. Right. So what they're doing, which is the way that I've done it in the past two years, I like that strategy is they are trading money for risk and time, right? Now, let's say that somebody buys, you know, 100 units, you know, in the hood. In, yeah, I wasn't going to say it, but sure, like that's kind of, I didn't know how to say that, but yeah, basically. So anyway, that is going to be on a like cash flow, like on a month to month, you'll make way more money. It will be a lot of risk, a lot of evictions and a lot of your time, or you've got to pay somebody else to manage them. So, it's just a trade off. It's not one that's right or wrong, but mm -hmm. you got to decide how you want to use your time. We right. work with probably what we have six, seven investors at this point, Julian. All of them have their own strategy. And what we try to do with our investors is find out exactly that. Like, what is what is the strategy right for that yep. person? Absolutely. Because if you get somebody who's doing investing and you put them in the hood or a lower income area, however you want to politically or unpolitically say it, you know, and they get a bad taste in mouth, like they're not going to buy more homes, mm -hmm. right? So you got to, or vice versa, someone who's driven by the money. Like if you put them in something that we buy, they're not going to buy more homes because the cash flow is not enough. So you got to find that page for that yeah. investor. So I, I want to kind of do like a little yeah. survey with them. All of our investors are on different portfolio strategies. Twenty five percent of our buyers last year were in Twenty five percent in the whole board. That's, that's interesting. They were saying uh, last. It's very interesting. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things they're also saying that they contribute to the housing national. shortage. The national and the, the one thing they're portraying is like a potential problem down the road. Is as investors buy more and more properties, so it's less and less homeowners are owning, then it's less and less properties are coming for sale. The more and more it's going to get more difficult for buyers. Like it's just it's complicating the, the supply situation. And we can see that because our buying age is going up too. Yep. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But that doesn't mean you all shouldn't be investors. And again, you sometimes have first swing at the bat. So have you guys? Do you have any investment properties? Mm -hmm. Yes. How many? Eight. Eight. Awesome. And when did you start? Um, 2008. Ten? No, more than 10 years ago. 12 years ago. That's awesome. How old were you when you started? Well, we started with my husband. Okay. Uh, but we also kept my first home uh, when we met. Um, she was probably 25. I bought my first house when I was 24. Right. Any regrets? Get a good no. strategy and mm -hmm. keep going. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. I unfortunately sold my first two. So. Okay. And that it was like, oh my gosh, you're such great money. We should sell it now because yeah. Yeah. you were you sold at the proper time if you were going to sell. So yeah. yeah, I mean, I made a pretty penny off of it. Uh, unfortunately, the relationship bit it, and now I'm without a house. So okay. yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Have you, no, have you ever I'm, thought about it or uh, no 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 that's why I'm in real estate. I've had uh, four investment homes and uh, I got in real estate. So oh, awesome. buy and sell or just no, nope. uh, we were not very good landlords, we were too busy. Okay. And so we um I mean it took us several years. We sold the last one in uh, fall of 2021. Okay. Uh make great profit and uh Right now, I'm not interested to get back into it. Yeah, and again, it's, it can be an opportunity. You can choose that opportunity. Or, we learn or a not. lot, but, you know, it's, it's a lot to it. You know, they don't just take care of themselves just because you got paid. Right. Because then when you, you know, well, I, in, you're like, oh, my God, what happened here? And I do I think uh, the reason we never got into it, we actually do have someone that just takes care of all of it. Like, yeah. we don't get the calls and that's just how we want it to be so. i mean I wouldn't, I wouldn't say never mm -hmm. and i mean i might do it but um it have to be the right the right situation the right option right for us the compromise was just put it in someone's hand and pay for that so we don't and we did this. i mean i kept my first house my husband kept his house 
I've rented it for 15 years. And then it was, you know, the market was good. It was a good time to sell. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Who has a who's ever done a balance sheet for themselves personally? I don't do that. I have people. Right. You're going to ask me to tell you how to do it. Um, some people are intimidated. If you, you know, it's really not hard. And I'm happy to stay after this class. I have forms that I can kind of show you how to do it as far as, you know, you put your house, it's assets, and then it's the debt that goes against that. And the difference is your equity. Um, I, I, you don't need an accounting background, but I do have an accounting background. Um, and I have these forms and I'm happy to send them to you so that you could do them. But I think it's really cool if you're setting goals to also do your balance sheet once a year. See where you are and save them. It's fun. You know, 20 years down the road, those houses are getting, you're paying them off. They're getting more, you know, equity in them. They're getting higher value in them. So having a balance sheet and totaling it up once a year is, I had to, honestly, I didn't do one until I got in this position. To get in this position, you had to have a certain amount of equity on that balance sheet. And um, and now I've been doing them pretty much on a yearly basis. So um, upgrade your five. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Say it louder for the people in the back. All right. <laughs> you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I believe part of the reason Nicole Belcher stepped into this position and she can dispute that or agree with that is that she got to upgrade her five of the people that she gets to hang out with here. Listen, and I know, you know, uh, who she was around when she had her party business versus who she was around in a real estate business versus who she's now around as a team leader. It continues to elevate that. Yes. Um, and yeah, think about your five. And if you go, oh, I don't really have a good five, you would be shocked. You would be absolutely shocked if you picked up one of the wealthiest people you know and asked them to lunch or coffee. If you're like, you know what? I went to a wealth building class. It was amazing. And I don't know if you would just share your story with me, but I would love to hear it. They, that's a compliment. Like I bet most people would say yes and dang, you know. You would have gone to lunch with a millionaire or multimillionaire. So um, create a wealth building group, find a mentor, get an accountability partner. Team leader can be accountability partner. Your, your immediate team can be accountability partners. Um, and then just having a mentor, um, somebody that can pour into you. Mike, did you have a mentor? When you started Keller Williams, have you had somebody that's kind of mentored you in your uh, Nicole? Besides me, uh, one of the your investor friend at the beginning of two years. Uh, I have a friend that he has like 350 properties. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't want him on. He's, he's our age. Two years older than me. I think he's bringing in like 40,000 a month in cash flow. So that's my goal. So he was, he was really like a mentor to me. Um, one of the best in sharing real estate with us in the school. I think the people that she was around uh, just ended up being a group of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we, you know, we we're talking about wealth and, and mentors and that, and that's great, but also like, how do we hold on to our money and make sure the government get doesn't get too much of it? Do we have financial advisors? You know, even at a young age, I don't care if you're 19. Well, if you don't go for it, like you can read books that will teach you most of that stuff. So even if you don't know the person, there's someone that's putting information out there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They don't really find don't the, resourceful, the resourcefulness. You don't right. think that right. how can I find this that I need? So one of the um, things that Nicole has, uh, my, my account will quit on me. And believe me, he told me I was one of his most complicated customers. I was like, oh crap, you know, I, I have to move all this. So Nicole had me talk to her accountant and I'm learning tax strategies right now that I'm like, damn it. 
damn it. You know, you just feel kind of stupid and late to the table. You're like, so one of the things I learned is um, we can all have a 401k and we can put, how much can we put in a 401k every year as an individual? Seven grand, eight grand, something like that. You know how many you can put in if you do a step, which is for your company or your business? Anyone know that number? 57,000 per individual. So you can do 57 and your wife can do 57. You just hidden $114,000 from the government legally by having a set. So there's just strategies out there. Financial advisors is who we normally would go to. This gentleman is Mike Shelton. Is that his last name? Yeah. Money Mike. Money Mike. Um, 360 Financials. So he did a whole, I said, like, why are more accountants not like this? Like why? And I've had great accountants, like I've had a, la a great account in the last 10 years, but they would never give me this kind of advice. And he's like, you know, that's what I found. And he's like, that's what I wanted. So I, I do both. And he does give me tax strategies. So either go to a financial advisor or go to an accountant like Mike, he's right here in town that will give you some of those financial and do that early. Like, even if you don't have any money, do that early so you can start understanding the concepts of protecting that money from the IRS and those rates that I just showed you starting at 22%. Like, even if you can only hide away a couple thousand dollars, let's do that for the time being until, until you can work up to bigger numbers. Um, Keller Williams is offering an eight week course to wealth. It is, you can, do the SKU, it's starting on March 1st. I am going to take it and I wanna take it so that I can share. It's $400 and it's eight weeks. At the end of it, they're actually going to give you a plan that's individualized for you. So- um, Tina, do you have another appointment? No, nope, all good. Great. Um, yeah, so that might be something that you want to um, do. Eight weeks to well. Um, and- yeah, so that was pretty much what I was going to talk about. And I'm happy to send out the presentation and put it in your inbox. With that, there are gonna be the 411, the 135, the goal setting. So we actually have what Keller Williams gives us. So that'll all be in your inbox with the presentation. Um, if you wanna go back and take a look at anything. But are there any questions, Tanya, or anyone else? Thank you, Tim. Huh? So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. I believe in 45-minute class.